Vote yet, Colin? Uh, no sign yet, Kay. Ballots numbers four and five are taking place in the Sistine Chapel this afternoon. We're reaching the crunch point. This is the business end of the day. Let's introduce our two guests, Alistair Bruce, our ceremonial events commentator, and Austin Ivory, who talks us through the, the first black smoke yesterday, Austin, Austin from Catholic Voices. Let's play Fantasy Conclave, Austin. What happens if we see white smoke now? If we see white smoke now, that means obviously that we have a Pope. Now what that means is that the one among them, the one of the 15, 115 who has got those necessary two-thirds votes, uh, has been elected. He has to first of all accept. They ask him, do you accept uh, being elected as Supreme Pontiff? He has to say yes. There's a canonical, a legal formula. He has to include the word yes. Then from that moment he is Bishop of Rome. And then various things happen. He then goes to the what's called the Room of Tears, and it's called that because that's the moment where the Pope feels the weight of what's just been entrusted to him. There waiting for him are three white vestments made for him by Gamarelli's, the papal tailors. Um, small, medium and large doesn't apparently quite capture it, but, you know, roughly. And there he, he, he dresses in, the, in white, and from that moment on, uh, he is the Pope. And then, of course, the other cardinals have to then swear their obedience to him, and that will all take some time. He'll also, by the way, uh, be, and this is new in this conclave, on the way out to the balcony, he will be stopping to pray before the Blessed Sacrament in the, in the Pauline Chapel, um, and that will all take time. Uh, then eventually, we think probably 40, 50 minutes after the white smoke, uh, then Cardinal Turan will appear on the balcony. He's the one who will then announce the name of the Pope. Alistair, your thoughts? Well, it's a huge burden of responsibility on the whole process to get this right. I think that the whole process of going in to choose whether it's small, medium, or large, it actually made me laugh because <laughs> they always used to say there'd be small, medium, large, and John the 23rd, because he the was Roly, so... Holy Pope. Exactly. Whether they'll have a... There's no need this time. There's nobody of that stature, <laughs> I think, necessarily going to be selected. But then, indeed, appearing here, it'll probably take between half an hour and three-quarters of an hour from that moment of white smoke before the new Pope appears to what will then be a packed square. The piazza already is filling up, but you imagine when the announcement comes out with just... 45 minutes, the entire of those who are available nearby the Vatican will come and fill this area. In fact, I'm just worrying about whether the security down there is going to be able to cope with the number who will come. They'll probably fill out the Via della Conciliazione down there all the way down as far as they can to the Tiber. Austin, people want to be part of that historic moment, yeah. don't they? We were talking yesterday about mm. a seminarian at the English College where they train young men to be English priests. He was 12 when Benedict assumed the throne. Uh, this is a moment of history. People want to yeah. be part of it. I mean, for Catholics, and particularly people who happen to be in Rome at the time because they're priests who are studying here, for example, you know, they never forget it. It's a bit like where were you when kind of JFK was... You know, it, it's a moment they never forget. By the way, when, when Cardinal Turan comes out on that cal balcony, the world will be listening to the very first words. And, of course, they are famous words. We have great news, habemus papam, and so on. But then he will say the name. Now, the name will be said in Latin. Now, the journalists have already been studying what is the Latin equivalent of the first names of the cardinals who are of it the papa. It was simple with Joseph Ratzinger, well, relatively simple, wasn't it? Josephum. Not, right. Josephum you exactly. could hazard a guess, right? Exactly. And indeed, if it's, uh, for example, uh, Timothy Dolan of New York, that will be Timoteum. Uh, if it's Leonardo Sandri, that will be Leonardum. So, on the whole, it'll be probably quite easy to guess. By the way, my favourite is if it's Cardinal Whirl of Washington, that will be Donaldum. I think splendid. He's, Donald, he's Donald. But if it's Johannem, for example, there are quite a few papabile who are John. So therefore, you know, there'll be that moment saying, it won't be a clincher, just no, know the first name. We'll be having to wait for that surname as well. It's been suggested that one of the reasons they seem to rattle through the two ballots this morning is that we're actually talking about a conclave with some younger, sprightlier cardinals. I mean, yeah. could it be as simple as that? Actually, Father Lombardi, the Vatican spokesman, clarified that just earlier. The reason why it's taking shorter time this time is that there aren't any infirm cardinals back in the residence of the Santa Marta. Now, in 2005, um, having voted, they then had to take the urn back to the residence for the ones who hadn't been able to make it to the Sistine Chapel. That hasn't happened this year. That apparently why it's much quicker. Also, just to look ahead even further than when the smoke uh, starts to issue from the chimney, there's a small matter of an installation mass. Some people were speculating, well, maybe Saturday, it's the Rome Marathon, uh, or Sunday, I should say, it's the Rome Marathon on Sunday, 
uh, Islander in town to play Italy on on the Saturday. So we've got a crowd That'll boost schedule. numbers. That'll It'll boost, boost numbers. no doubt about that. Uh, but we're talking about world leaders that would descend. And you think back to the funeral of John Paul II in 2005, and what a spectacle that was. And what an opportunity, actually, it was for people like Mahmoud Ahmadinejad to, to stand shoulder to shoulder. Uh, literally rather than metaphorically, which George W. Bush. It was a huge occasion. It's a great opportunity for the Vatican and for the Roman Catholic Church, and I think a long conclave gathers more and more interest. And I would imagine they'd probably want to protract it in order to increase that anyway. Very good. The most watched seagull in the world. I know. <laughs> yes. Perching on top yes. of the chimney. It the keeps coming chapel. back at the critical <laughs> time, that knowing that seagull that has no seen. idea that it's part of history, does it? <laughs> it's... Um, in terms of the crowds which have gathered, Alistair was saying it's pretty full now, the piazza. I mean, it's a, a space that can take thousands of people, yes. Austin. It's a, you know, it's, it's a big it's a, I mean, I, it's a theatrical space. I mean, it is designed for the great symbols and drama of liturgy. And, of course, it is, it is perfect for a moment like this. Even with this incredibly um, ghastly rain, I mean, this must be the wettest conclave in history. I've been reading history of conclaves. They don't generally record what the weather was like, because in general in Rome, the weather's OK. Um, certainly in 2005, it wasn't fabulously hot, but it was a nice, clear afternoon when that white smoke came. This time we've got rain, and there is quite a chill in the air. There really is. Oh, Alice, I was interested in what you were saying about the idea that this is an opportunity almost to be an instrument of evangelization. Let's show the wares of the Catholic Church. That was really clear yesterday, wasn't it? We had those beautiful pictures, that fantastic sound of the litany of the saints being chanted by the Vatican Choir and the cardinals themselves. It was absolutely hypnotic. It was entirely dignified structure through which this really important decision is taking place. And I think the juxtaposition of that dignified process and this important decision making that has to take place is very much part of what is being communicated here but also I think with the whole world now looking at that that single chimney it is a huge opportunity for the Catholic Church to focus the world's attention and when the new Pope does appear on the balcony on the what's called the, uh, the, the balcony of benediction he will give his first Erbi et Orbi address, a chance to give to the city and to the world his first blessing. And from a pope, a blessing has extra import. And it's the first one he'll give and he'll have the whole world looking. And it is a chance, I think, in the words he also gives, maybe to give that first message prior to the homily of his first inauguration, to give a sense of which way he will take the church. Alistair, you commentated on um, the 2010 papal visit to the UK. Um, that was a relatively rare visit by Pope Benedict because already he wasn't seen as a great traveller in the, in the way of the young John Paul II. People will be hoping for somebody who's prepared to put the air miles in again, won't they? Well, I think that it's an opportunity that those who met in the general congregations or, that the cardinals held before must have borne in mind because they want to make sure that whoever they choose goes out there and acts as the evangelist that Jesus Christ is expecting, in a sense, to be elected from whoever is available as the successor of St. Peter. Uh, it's got uh, to be powerful, the person uh, who does and it. And I think that's part of the reason why he did choose to resign, Benedict XVI, mm. because, in fact, he took the decision, I understand, after his Mexican-Cuban trip last year, where apparently he fell and so on. And a, a modern pope has to travel. He actually did travel a lot, even though he was, he was by then in his 80s. He did about 27 trips, and most of them actually pretty successful. They tended to be much shorter and less ambitious than John Paul II's. But I think Benedict himself has said, uh, you know, a modern pope needs to travel. That is part of the vocation of the successor of St. Peter, is, is to take himself around the world and build the faith of the church wherever he, wherever he goes. And, of course, the church is an increasingly global place. And, you know, yeah, you have to pack in the air mask. Austin, just one final thought really from you. How has your thinking evolved since you stood with us here around about this time yesterday afternoon into the evening and guided us through the, uh, the first black smoke that came from the Sistine Chapel. How are, you think, how are you feeling about things now? Well, I said last night that um, I expected this to go beyond four ballots. So if we do get a Pope now, within the next hour, I would be surprised, and it would actually seem to me that we had misjudged this, that, that actually there was one <laughs> strong contender. I think probably what's happened today 
is that they've been focusing on those few names that, are, that have the possibility of getting to 77, uh, and they've been working on them. But of course, we have no idea uh, whether there's one that's run ahead of the others, or whether there's two or three. And this is the point. This is, you know, we talked about the alchemy of a conclave, you know, what results from it. This is the really crucial thing that's going on at the moment, is, is how you can get that candidate to emerge from the consensus of those 115 cardinals. And of course, what can often happen is that somebody who is uh, desired by one group of cardinals isn't desired by another group, and they then have to start to look for the third. So my feeling is, if it's a pope today, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a gamble and say it's probably Cardinal Scola who was reckoned to have attracted a number of votes. If it isn't Cardinal Scola, then I think we're into a much wider field, and those developing world cardinals and indeed North American cardinals that I've been talking about come into the frame, but I think that would probably be tomorrow. Okay, well if you're wrong, we're going to bring you back and make you apologise. I hope so. I, 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 <laughs> I, I, I expect to be punished and humiliated. <laughs> Thanks both very much indeed. Uh, that seagull, I suppose it's uh, on a rainy, cold day, it's quite a cosy spot uh, sitting, standing above a stove, uh, but for many of the thousands of people who've gathered on the piazza, it's absolutely filthy. Uh, they are showing great stoicism, uh, but they hope, they hope to be in on a piece of history that many of them will take away to the countries from which they have come and cherish for many a long day yet. We'll keep an eye across that chimney for you, of course. First time to smoke, we'll be straight back to you, Kay.